So anyway, uh, so not to make it longer, I'd like to pass the floor to the chair of this webinar, um, who will provide some background on the importance of addressing clearing and SLCP emissions from the oil and gas sector. So our chair is um, Sarah Smith, who is the program director for super pollutants at the Clean Air Task Force. Sarah leads the Clean Air Task Force team uh, focusing on minimizing emissions of short-lived lived climate pollutants. She serves as co-chair of the Methane Partners Campaign, which advocates for methane pollution standards for the U.S. oil and gas industry. So, Sarah, um, I'll just give you the floor. Terrific. Thank you, Denise, and thank you, everyone, for joining the event today. I was, uh, I thought we'd start with a little background on the problem before hearing from our three esteemed experts who will fortunately spend the bulk of the call on solutions. I was reflecting on the scope of the flaring problem leading up to this event. It's enormous, the 140 billion cubic meters of gas that's wasted by flaring every year, which is equivalent to the annual gas consumption of South America and Central America combined. The CO2 footprint of that flaring is equal to about the greenhouse gas emissions of France or Italy, 300 million tons per year. But that is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of climate impacts because we're learning that a lot of methane and black carbon is also re released alongside that CO2. Some recent research by the Environmental Defense Fund in the Permian Basin in Texas, in the US, is finding that a lot more methane is being released uh, than, than we previously knew. And the, that's the improper, um, improperly lit flares, incomplete combustion, that can also lead to a lot of black carbon emissions as well. And then you have the health impacts of the toxic volatile organic compounds and the smog forming nitrogen oxides and the deadly particulate matter, with the PM being the black carbon of focus uh, for this project. And all of that air pollution raises serious concerns for people living near flares in addition to the noise and the heat that can harm humans and the environment. So where are we on solving this huge global problem and reaping the climate and health and energy benefits? Fortunately, dozens of com companies and countries have committed to ending routine flaring of their associated gas by 2030. But the global picture does not yet show a decisive downward trend. And we see some troubling increases in the US where I'm from, where flaring increased 50% between 2017 and 2018 due to increased production. And we see similar increases in other parts of the world, especially places experiencing political unrest. On the bright side, we can point to some oil basins that are developed with little or no routine flaring due to sufficient takeaway capacity good planning to transport or utilize the gas. In these areas, flaring only typically occurs due to upsets or uh, unsafe conditions. Oil producers are planning development, making sure there are pipelines in place before completing wells. But in other cases, in many other parts of the world, um, the higher oil prices and the lower gas prices can lead to companies investing and expanding their oil production without first planning to ensure adequate um, takeaway capacity. And in these cases, we see a lot of flaring and venting of associated gas. So the question for today is what tools exist to help, especially in these scenarios where we're seeing a lot of flaring. And today we'll hear about some profitable opportunities to recover from that flare stream the high value condensable liquids and reduce the overall all amount of gas that is being flared. Uh, we'll have lots of questions for, lots of time for questions at the end. So we'll just go through all of the speakers, starting with um, Dave Picard, who's president of Clearstone Engineering. And in that role, he led the implementation of um, Clearstone's work on this black carbon technology demonstration project over the past few years. And Clearstone also provides consulting services 
for the provision of specialized expertise in the areas of process design, air pollution control, odor control, and emission measurement and information systems. So Dave, I'll pass it to you. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are, to, to everyone. Um, the, the project I'm going to speak to you about is a CCAC sponsored project to demonstrate the practicability of mitigating BC or black carbon emissions from flaring activities in the oil and gas sector. Black carbon, uh, based on the IPCC fifth assessment report, has a global warming potential of 900 um, over a one year, or sorry, over a 100 year time horizon compared to a value of one for CO2, but only persists in the atmosphere for a matter of days to weeks, which makes it a particularly powerful short lived climate forcer and a, an ideal candidate for targeting to achieve near term mitigation of global warming. Um, Interestingly, black carbon emissions are, are strongly linked to the presence of elevated concentrations of propane and heavier hydrocarbons in the flare gas stream. And these same precursors enhance the value of the flare gas stream and potential for cost-effective mitigation opportunities. The primary objective of the, the collaboration was to identify some high impact cost-effective flaring reduction opportunities and assist in advancing these to the implementation stage, with the ultimate goal really being of achieving real quantifiable black carbon reductions at the, at the end of this initiative. Um, in achieving improved social license through co-benefits such as improved local air quality um, related to reduced emissions of criteria air contaminants and for example, reduced electrical brownouts and blackouts is seen as an important aspect of the work. So wherever possible, we've, we've tried to um, identify where there was a, a linkage to local uh, landowners or residents' concerns and where we could quantify some of these um, co-benefits. That was a particular objective of our, our work. The basic workflow that we went through comprised initiating a, a measurement program at selected sites that had been identified by the collaborating participants. Um, in this particular case, there was two companies that we collaborated with, and I'll refer to them as collaborator one and collaborator two, or operator one and operator two. Um, but basically they came forward with high impact or highly replicable flaring reduction opportunities we conducted measurement programs at those sites. We then went through a pre-screening step to identify potential mitigation opportunities that would exist based on site-specific constraints and an understanding of the root cause of the flaring activities at those sites. Uh, we, we then conducted for the relevant um, mitigation options or technologies that could be applied, a rigorous pre-feasibility assessment to determine which of those opportunities would be most um, favorable to implement at those sites. And we also engaged in a, a due diligence process where we vetted the results of, of that work with the operations and engineering groups that were responsible for the, the targeted facilities. And we then updated the inventory, sorry, updated these opportunities um, or at least the most favorable mitigation options that were identified to what we called a refined business case level. And that involved developing um, engineering drawings to show how we would implement the solution and integrate it with existing processes at the site, um, as well as conducting um, updated analyses of these facilities based on additional information that came out of the vetting process. And in two cases, we actually went out and, and got um, improved pricing from vendors to improve the quality of the overall business case that was being put forward. These were then submitted to senior management for their consideration. And the final step was really to, um, if appropriate, work with each of the operators to explore potential financing mechanisms. The 
the, the measurement program stage of the, the work comprised um, evaluating opportunities at, at eight selected sites. These um, measurement programs included a, a tracer test, an inline tracer test to measure the flow rate that was occurring at the time of the site visits. And, and these measurements were conducted for enough time to be able to characterize the variability in the flow as well as what the typical or average flow rate was. Um, and, and that information was, was important to collect because it, it would feed into our ultimate design process. Uh, we also collected samples of the gas that was being flared and submitted that to a laboratory for detailed analysis. In addition, we collected samples of the inlet oil, the sales oil, and if relevant, uh, the solvent that was being used as a diluent at the site. Uh, they were heavy oil sites. And um, all of that information fed into the design process related to how we would mitigate the emissions and what types of options we would, would apply. In addition, uh, there was a research team from Natural Resources Canada that participated in the work. They came to the field and applied a uh, mobile measurement technique called Skylosa to, to measure the black carbon emissions that were occurring at the time of our site visits. And that, uh, that information ultimately was intended to go into our final reports, um, but due to timing issues, wasn't quite available. Uh, when we produced our report. So we, we used uh, information from the literature that was actually based on prior measurements using Skylosa and um, inferred what the, the black carbon emissions would be based on the heating value of the gas streams that were being flared. Um, Michael Ayer will later on in the same presentation provide some in or more detailed discussion of the Skylosa measurement technique and, and other issues related to, to black carbon measurements. This slide shows the, the range of technologies that we considered for the measurement program. These technologies, uh, the ones in the dark blue boxes are really off-the-shelf technologies that um, were readily available uh, for the types of opportunities that we were looking at. The ones in the light blue boxes represent um, technologies that were either deemed to be emerging or were more restrictive in their applicability. Um, and for the cases that we looked at, we determined that they weren't relevant options for those opportunities. The, uh, the two boxes that are shown kind of a peach color represent different pathways for potentially recovering condensable hydrocarbons from the, the flare gas stream that were evaluated as part of the, the technology review process. When we conducted our reviews, we, we used a three-stage um, or we allowed for evaluation of up to three different stages of mitigation. And if after three stages of mitigation, there was still gas that um, couldn't be dealt with uh, economically, then that was deemed to go to, to flaring. Um, normally, the first stage of mitigation was to recover the condensable hydrocarbons from gas streams because those tended to have much greater value than the actual natural gas itself did. Uh, the second stage often was to try and use the residue gas from stage one to either displace uh, fuel purchases at the site, if applicable, or electric power purchases. And if there wasn't an opportunity to do that, then we looked at the potential to produce electric power that could be um, produced into the grid and, and sold um, as a valuable or a saleable product from, from the mitigation measure that was applied. This slide, um, the intent really is just to show you that when we went through the pre-screening process, we, we looked at quite a, a large number of opportunities that could potentially apply to a given site. Um, those opportunities really depended on what the cause of the flaring was and on whether the gas was particularly rich in hydrocarbons and how close the facility was to existing gathering systems or markets. Um, in any case, we, we went through site by site, identified those technologies that had some applicability to the particular case we were looking at, and that led us to our pre-feasibility assessment. Pre-feasibility assessment we conducted um, had a number of different layers to it. This diagram depicts in the inner loop um, the fact that the first step was to look at the production decline rates over the 
project life and determine what the activity levels in each year of the project would be. The next loop or layer was to determine what the disposition of those activity values was in terms of how much was going to sales gas, how much was going for use as fuel, how much would be vented, and how much would be flared. And this was done through running rigorous uh, flow sheet simulation models of the mitigation option that was being considered, and as well considering the, the operating range and, and flow variability for the, um, the flaring gas stream that was being recovered. Uh, the next layer was to, based on those results, determine what the black carbon, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and criteria air contaminant emissions would be in each year of the time series for both the mitigated and unmitigated cases. And the difference between the two would be what the emission reduction potential for the opportunity would be in a given year of the time series. The next layer out was to apply a, a techno-economic analysis where we would determine what the capital expenditure or cost of the technology would be in year one. And then we would look at what the operating costs would be in each year of the time series based on activity values and, and the types of technologies implemented. And we would also consider other things such as um, carbon taxes, royalties that would be due, inflation rates, discount rates, um, income taxes that would be applicable to the analysis. The next layer out was to do a design optimization. So we had a, an optimization algorithm that would run all of the underlying calculations multiple times to determine what the optimum design configuration would be, the, the optimum operating conditions for that solution, and the optimum size of that um, solution based on the decline rates and the variability of the stream that we were seeing, and come up with the, the combination of those parameters that gave us the best overall economics. And if the, the project didn't last for 10 years, it became, un, un, sorry, uneconomic prior to the 10 year life that we were evaluating, then we would end the project at that point. But in all cases, we saw life expectancies that uh, would last up to, to 10 years at least. And then the last layer of the modeling was to look at different carbon pricing scenarios and see what impact that would have on all of the underlying calculations that were performed. So we looked at uh, three different scenarios. The first scenario was, in Colombia, they have a new carbon market that has um, just been implemented. And the, the price of carbon is approximately $6 US per tone or metric ton of CO2 equivalent emissions based on your normal GHT calculation of CO2, CH4, and, and nitrous oxide. We then looked at what would happen to that um, or to the results if you instead of using a traditional calculation of uh, CO2 equivalent, if you added in black carbon as a contributing um, climate forcer and applied that 900 global warming potential to it and its emissions. And then the last scenario that we looked at was what would happen if you considered black carbon in your CO2 equivalent calculations and you rose to what the current estimates of the social cost of um, greenhouse gas emissions are and um, how that would impact, again, all of the, the underlying economics and, and design outcomes that you would have for your, your approach. That information was then used to um, basically determine what the best mitigation option appeared to be for each site. We then went to the next level of developing process flow diagrams, uh, piping instrumentation drawings, and plot plans to show how that mitigation measure would be implemented at the site. We reviewed this with the, the operations and engineering groups at the facility well, that were responsible for the facilities that we, we surveyed. Um, in two cases, as I mentioned earlier, we, we went to vendors to actually get um, pricing quotes on the key equipment that was being proposed as part of the mitigation measure, um, took that information and, and additional input that had come from 
uh, vetting through the, the operations and engineering groups, updated our analyses, and prepared a final business case that was uh, submitted to senior management for their consideration. The commodity pricing that we used in the analysis is shown on this particular slide. Um, it just shows that we, we looked at what would happen if you treated all the flare gas as just being a natural gas stream and, and evaluated on an energy basis, but as well, if you were to extract some of the components of that gas and sell them as separate commodities, what, what prices we would have applied. Or if you took some of that energy and use it to produce electric power, what type of um, pricing you would get. This table shows what the relative value of each of those commodities would be compared to natural gas or methane. So what these factors indicate are that um, if you take LPG, for example, you would get 1.8 times as much value by extracting it from the gas stream and selling it as a separate commodity as you would by leaving it in the gas stream. Um, Pentanes Plus, you would get 4.1 times as much value out of extracting it and selling it as a separate commodity than you would if you left it in, in the gas stream. So clearly, there's some drivers to uh, to incent any mitigation option to try and at least recover some of those hydrocarbons from the gas before it is used either for fuel or if it can't be used for anything else, uh, if it's simply flared to help improve the overall um, economics of the opportunity and, and reduce the amount of gas that's being flared. And, and by simply recovering the the higher or heavier molecular weight uh, hydrocarbons, um, you also help to reduce the black carbon emission potential for those, those applications. This slide shows the, the range of economic parameters that um, were considered. Uh, basically, those were all identified in the earlier slide where I showed you the pre-feasibility assessments. I won't spend any time on, on this particular slide. This slide shows photographs of the eight sites that um, we visited and the flares at those sites. And these flares actually represent a, a mix of circumstances, including liquid-rich gas, lean gas, stranded gas, uh, flaring due to design bottlenecks and process issues, and, and a range of small to large opportunities, which overall provide a reasonable cross-section of the types of flaring mitigation opportunities that you would expect to see in, in most jurisdictions. The slide shows um, the basic results that came out of our analysis. The, uh, the first two columns that are highlighted in blue show what the, the gross value of the opportunity is, depending on whether you value the opportunity based on heating value of the waste gas being flared, or if you value it on a commodity basis, which means that you would take out anything that had a, a value greater than methane or natural gas, uh, such as propane and, and uh, pentanes plus, you would extract those and sell those as separate commodities. If you did that, um, you get this, what I call a commodity basis pricing, which is in the cases of rich natural gas, substantially higher than the, um, the energy basis. The, the last two cases, seven and eight, uh, the gas was actually lean gas there, which is why you see that the, there's very little difference between the energy basis and, and the commodity basis. The, um, the middle column provides the, the payback period that was determined for each of these opportunities. Anything that was greater than four years of highlighted in red, and basically considered those to be um, having poor economics. Anything less than four years was deemed to be good economics. So on that basis, six out of the, the eight sites are opportunities that have reasonable economics to, to be advanced. The, um, the greenhouse gas potential in terms of CO2 equivalent lifetime reduction that would be achieved for each of these mitigation options is shown in the green column. And, and you can see that some of these numbers are quite large so that implementing these projects would, would have a high impact in terms of um, providing reduced climate forcing. This slide shows 
essentially the, the same results, um, just a little bit additional information on what mitigation options are really being considered. Um, out of all of the options, we never really went past a stage two mitigation measure. So stage one was always to look at, well, in most cases, to look at um, recovering the condensable hydrocarbons from the gas stream if it was a rich gas stream. And stage two, as mentioned earlier, was to look at either producing electric power or displacing fuel purchases. Um, the color coding here is to reflect what kind of outcomes were achieved. Uh, the first three options were identified as being profitable and um, were options that the, the operator of those facilities saw as good opportunities that they verbally committed to act on in the near term. The, um, the blue record is for site four was an opportunity that although the, the economics on it weren't that attractive today, it was an area where they were anticipating additional drilling to take place and they thought uh, strategically this was a, a good opportunity to uh, target as a, a mid-term or medium-term mitigation measure. Um, site five, which is kind of the peach colored one, was an opportunity that uh, the operator wanted to do more due diligence on to better understand the, um, the, the root cause of the flaring and decide how best to, to manage that opportunity. Uh, site six was uh, an opportunity that although um, marginally economic, um, in fact, didn't even achieve a a net positive uh, reduction of black carbon emissions and didn't meet the, the minimum threshold for uh, the type of opportunity that would be competitive in a, a normal oil and gas business model. So that one was uh, decided not to be acted on. The two last ones in white were cases where the operator uh, hadn't provided uh, feedback yet on, on what their intentions are for those opportunities, but they were actually good opportunities. They were um, Although small, uh, had a low capital cost, um, a nice or fairly attractive payback period, and would have been easy opportunities to, to implement over the, or at these facilities without a, a major shutdown. So overall, the, the outcomes that were achieved, um, the key outcome, I think, was really that the operator's experience through collaboration was sufficiently positive that they not only decided to take immediate action on some of the opportunities, um, they specifically requested additional support in helping to review the bids of some of the, the opportunities that were identified as being most favorable, and in particular, sites one and three. Um, and it was agreed, based on the strength of this, this feedback, to expand the collaboration through additional or different funding mechanisms. Um, and the expanded work activities are going to include a, a company-wide measurement program to look at fugitive equipment leaks, tank venting, and, and casing head venting. These were all um, priority objectives of the, the operator involved. And the, the driver for, for doing this work was not only to identify opportunities for mitigation, but also to identify opportunities to develop company and country specific um, emission factors that would allow improved reporting of, of the emissions and the reductions achieved in, in the sector. Um, additionally, it was agreed to do a demonstration project. At one of the sites, there was a flare that had, had some reliability issues and was experiencing reasonable uh, black carbon emissions. And so it was um, a project which has been initiated now to apply some retrofit upgrades to the flare to improve its performance and as well do black carbon emissions before and after to derive or to drive an optimization process to determine how best to minimize emissions from a flare where you can't actually uh, find anything economic to do with that gas. Um, so this is a a unique opportunity and then something that we think um, will be uh, beneficial to all stakeholders is the outcome of this particular work.
So how do the, the outcomes of what we've achieved here compare to what has happened in, in previous initiatives to try and catalyze um, activity for mitigating emissions in the oil and gas sector? Um, we've been involved in a lot of different initiatives working in not only our home country on, on projects to reduce emissions, but also in, in many countries around the world. And historically, the approach has always been to go in and identify as many opportunities as possible. So there wasn't a lot of time and effort spent on collecting information. It was how quickly could you get some relative indication of um, the size of an opportunity and move on to the next site or the next type of opportunity at the same site. And then there wasn't really a, a large focus on getting the kind of information that you would need to inform a design process and ultimately come up with a defensible business case. And, and the consequence of that was there tended to be a lot of skepticism. There was also a lack of resources in, in many cases within the companies to um, advance those activities to a point where someone could make a, an informed business decision on them. So rather than trying to, to maximize the number of opportunities that we were evaluating, the approach that was taken in this initiative was to look at a smaller number of opportunities, but go through the same sort of process that the company would normally go through for any capital expenditure project within its operations and, and try and come up with something that would align with the parameters that are being considered by the company um, in evaluating these types of opportunities. And the overall response is from what has occurred so far has been very positive and very strong. So the, the conclusions that we have for this project are one, that markets act on, on good investment opportunities and they'll even pay a premium for green products if one can differentiate their products as being um, less carbon intensive or emissions intensive than the average or other benchmarks that, that might exist. Um, the, the key criteria for a, a good investment opportunity are it has to be credible, uh, technically sound, and offer rewards that justify the risks. And of course, it has to be competitive with other investment opportunities in terms of its size and um, its, its return on investment. So some opportunities can be very small and have extremely attractive uh, rates of return, but they simply don't generate the same interest as, of course, a, a larger opportunity, even if the, the larger opportunity has um, a, returns, a reduced internal rate of return. Um, in any case, uh, addressing these issues and, and facilitating um, accelerated decision-making yields positive near-term and ongoing results. And, and our recommendations from this would really be that future projects to try and catalyze activity in sectors um, try to go through a more rigorous process of advancing opportunities to a point where people can make a business decision on them. And, and this is especially important where the technologies that are potentially being considered are different from what a company is normally used to and, and where the, the types of opportunities that are being evaluated uh, differ from those that are normally the primary focus of a company's operations or their business model. Here, yeah, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Terrific. We're going to move on to hearing from Michael Layer, who is a research engineer and the social, sorry, senior program manager at Natural Resources Canada, focusing on the Upstream Petroleum Air Issues Research Initiative. And Michael is very involved with several important international forums on venting and flaring and fugitive equipment leaks, including the Global Methane Initiative, the World Bank Global, Glass, Global, Global Gas Flaring Reduction Partnership, and of course, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, terrific. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, uh, Dave, for the opening presentation. You did a wonderful job of uh, paving the road for me to continue on. So um, as Dave described, let me just make sure I'm 
Hmm. What's going on here? Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. Your screen. Okay. Okay. For some reason, uh, my presentation is not advancing. Let me just pop out and let's see. Okay, there we go. So, um, building on what Dave shared earlier, uh, I just wanted to give a, a brief bit of background um, in regard to where this project sits uh, inside the population of things that we are doing together with uh, Canadian resourcing. So, the as Dave described and Denise made mention of as well, the uh, the current project that we're providing you with information on came out of um, funding from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, and uh, the the CCAC is a uh, is a target for Canada's climate financing. We uh, we contribute quite significantly into that uh, partnership and uh, it was funding from the CCAC based upon those contributions that funded this work here as well. And uh, sorry, uh, climate financing is administered by Environment and Climate Change Canada. And then in addition to the climate financing, uh, there's an energy innovation program that's administered out of Natural Resources Canada, here where I work. And uh, the the core of the objectives of our bilateral and multilateral engagement uh, in initiatives such as this is Canada's commitment to the implementation of nationally determined contributions with our partner countries to achieve black carbon and methane reductions. And the strategic objectives of our engagement uh, bilaterally and multilaterally are entirely driven by the countries with whom we are partnering and it is their nationally determined uh, contributions and their nationally determined uh, objectives and priorities that we are uh, partnering with them to implement. So. Uh, goes without saying that uh, flaring venting and fugitive emissions reduction is high on their priority list. Of, of uh, extreme interest to us and to this discussion is the uh, stated objective for improved measurement reporting and verification technologies and standards to support accurate measurement based emission factor development. One of the objectives for that is to improve their national inventories of course, but also to uh, begin to unpack opportunities for jurisdictional carbon trading or ITMOs and notwithstanding the ongoing uncertainty around the Article 6 rulebook under the uh, Paris Agreement, there is still franchise and opportunity under Article 6.2 for jurisdictions to agree to begin mutually exchanging credible uh, ITMOs and so we're supporting those objectives. Um, all of the countries are identifying for us that they want to identify high impact policy opportunities that span across the environment, the economy, energy and their social sustainability objectives as well. And uh, another particular interest that's shared by all is unlocking financing to actually implement high impact emissions mitigation opportunities. So the the examples that Dave just provided, it seems highly likely based upon our current communications that the financing uh, or the capitalization of those projects is likely going to be undertaken from within the budgets of the companies with whom we are working. But the rigor with which Dave has developed uh, these, these refined business cases and these project opportunities are such that they could be table dropped into the cap capital market and I also cite here you know patient green investments I think we're all aware of the fact that there is policy being developed in regard to green bond eligibility so I think it's important to cite that uh, the types of projects that we're discussing here today and that Dave made mention of by design do not lead to the uh, extension of the life of a field or the life of a facility per se. So notionally, those types of um, projects, implementation of these types of projects could potentially be eligible for a uh, green bond or patient green investment as well. 
so as Dave described, and as you saw from his presentation, we're taking a resource management based approach to emissions mitigation. And we're, we're aware, and I think all of us on this call are aware that the uh, um, that unmeasured and poorly measured uh, slippage of our recoverable hydrocarbon commodities into the environment via intentional venting and flaring or unintentional fugitive emissions uh, is an opportunity space that we haven't necessarily fully capitalized upon yet. And when we vent those hydrocarbon commodities in compliance with policies and regulations, they become our criteria air contaminant and our GHG issues. And then of course, when we flare those uh, commodities, uh, we as a sector are thrust into the population of the globe's most significant contributors to black carbon emissions, which are both toxic and of course have uh, a very, very significant and um, potent climate forcing. Uh, component to them. So what we are seeking to uncover or unpack are high impact emissions mitigations opportunities, but we're also seeking to identify and to disrupt the policy and the technology innovation pathways that are currently either distancing us from implementing those opportunities or are leading to those opportunities being overlooked entirely. So Dave made very brief reference earlier to the Sky Losta technology that, uh, that we deployed together with Dave, uh, led by um, Dr. Brian Crosland from my team here. Um, and I will not spend a great deal of time deep diving into the technology itself. Um, I cite for you here in the second sub bullet of the uh, top text that there's actually quite a very detailed presentation on the CCAC web page uh, of this technology and Dr. Matthew Johnson, who led the development of this. It was a collaboration between his, his university, Carleton University, Natural Resources Canada, and the National Research Council here in Canada as well. And as you see, I also am providing you with a URL that uh, leads directly to a library of peer-reviewed published journal articles that uh, that do some deep diving into this technology, into other studies as well. So there's a great deal of uh, useful information available uh, to the audience uh, to unpack this technology and um, our research uh, to, to a, more, a more deep level. But in short, the, the Skylosa technology is an optical technology uh, and what we are measuring is the transmissivity of the diffuse light skylight through the plume and we're coupling that with uh, the research and the knowledge around the optical properties of black carbon soot and light scattering theory uh, for clustered particles and that yields a very accurate uh, bc black carbon concentration or and that concentration is then coupled with the measurements that we undertake for the plume velocity uh, instantaneously as well and that allows for calculation of instantaneous black carbon emissions and what you see in the lower video on the right is uh, the um, analysis results of the Skylosa technology and in the graphical presentation the red line that you see there is the mean uh, mass flux of black carbon and the gray zone above and below that red line is the 95% confidence interval. And you can see from that graphical display in the video that the technology is quite sensitive to even slight perturbations or changes in the emissions flux of black carbon. And so as David described, when we couple this technology with the instantaneous measurement and speciation technologies and practices that were undertaken by way of the project, um, we were able to identify a, uh, a an opportunity to both quantify the black carbon uh, emissions in terms of the uh, slipped hydrocarbon uh, product that uh, that could be recovered. And this type of research also lends itself well to the development of the emission factors. Uh, if you go to that website uh, near the top of the page, you will see a recent paper by Brad Conrad and Matthew Johnson that identifies the uh, heating 
value approach that was taken to emission factor development, and Dave made reference to having used that emission factor to develop uh, the results that he presented just a little while ago. And um, myself and Brian Crosland were actually on the phone with Matt yesterday discussing additional and ongoing research, and we're going to be advancing not only the heating fact, uh, the, the heating value-based emission factor research, but also um, research into developing emission factors that are specifically linked to the extended gas analysis or the, or the speciation of the, uh, of the flows. So next slide uh, describes a little bit some of the results of deploying this technology into the field. So the top flare you see is um, what I think industry would identify as being a reasonably clean flare and it happens to be situated inside an urban center with a population of just about 200,000 people. The lower image is the very first field deployment of the technology into Uzbekistan where Dave Picard and Matt Johnson um, visited. They are based upon a GGFR project. And the results, you see them here, but the results out of context, they're meaningless. They're meaningless and they really have no impact or value. So um, Matt sat down and tried to put them into a scope or a dimension that started to make sense to people. So the upper flare, um, equivalent to 16 diesel buses continuously driving and the lower flare, 500 diesel buses continuously driving. Those types of data began to resonate with people when we made presentations. And it, it spurned conversation in regard to, you know, what are economies currently spending to retrofit diesel engines in order to achieve environmental and health outcomes. And Denise and Valentin, you know, who is hosting us today, uh, she's also very heavily implicated in the transportation component of the CCAC. And if you go to that component of the CCAC webpage, you'll see volumes of really good information that describe what the opportunities are, but that also point out that there are limits to realizing those opportunities and those limits are largely economic and it costs tens if not hundreds of millions for municipalities or jurisdictions to retrofit their diesel fleets and uh, when we spoke to those municipalities and to those um, jurisdictional regulators they were unaware that this type of opportunity existed within their jurisdiction and had been quantified and uh, put into a perspective that they could understand. And uh, I was reading a, an article not too long ago, I believe EDF are the authors of this, where uh, it's been clearly indicated that investments in retrofitting diesel engines in order to get incremental improvements in their black carbon output can yield 10 to 20 times the investment in net present value in economic health benefits. So there are some significant opportunities here where cross-cutting knowledge, cross-cutting information and technologies can identify opportunities to implement solutions um, that are currently overlooked by policy uh, and regulation as well as the operators in the industry. And you notice that the picture changed at the bottom right. Very often when I present this here in Canada and elsewhere, uh, the immediate suggestion is that we don't have those kinds of issues in North America. Um, this is a picture of a city in Canada that's facing the same challenge. So we all have these opportunities uh, because we all have these challenges. So moving on, this is my final slide, but I'd like to spend a little bit of time discussing here um, and, and to make some points. So um, I'd, I'd like for us to consider that uh, policies and available technologies determine and sustain the performance that we realize at any given moment. And uh, in this space, I think we've uh, identified clearly over and over again, no matter what country we go to, that in order to achieve the optimal results that are available to us requires that we disrupt both the technology pathways as well as the policy pathways. I think we're all aware that uh, stretch goal policies absent the technologies and the resources to realize and implement them um, quickly become a thin veneer of terminology and they, they're prone to fail. And breakthrough technologies uh, often have little or no impact in penetrating the economy and uh, having results that are optimal uh, to the breakthrough that they provide because the barriers, the policy barriers that they have to overcome are sometimes really, really significant. And so 
disrupting both creates some optimal pathways. So this is a case study. Um, if you look at the image on the bottom right, uh, situations like this bring together industry operators, industry executives, regulators, policymakers, and the objective when they are brought together is to get rid of the to suppress the soot that you see being generated by that flare in that picture. Uh, for context, this flare is situated in an urban center. It's just one of a few flares in an urban center with a population of around 400,000 people. And so current policy pathways bring people together to address problems such as this based upon compliance with existing policies and regulations for mitigation. And the pathways that are determined for uh, addressing this type of a situation are kind of compelling the design audience to focus on the end of the pipe and uh, it results in soot suppression technology being deployed into the space and as we're all aware, um, technologies and processes uh, age and they deteriorate and they require management and and improvements and uptake. So uh, as you see in the video above, this soot suppression system is not functionally optimally and it's actually extinguishing the flame and turning the flare into a vent, which is not an ideal environmental outcome. So uh, when we visited this facility, when I say we, Dave Picard, myself, Matt Johnson, others, um, there was an approach taken to evaluating this uh, particular opportunity and I'm unpacking for you here the compliance based uh, approach with existing policies. So a, a $19 million not insignificant or immaterial opportunity to avoid um, energy costs and to reduce CO2 emissions by 22 kilotons a year. And then Dave also identified the potential to switch from steam to compressed air, and that provided some additional opportunities. And then Dave also undertook to look at this situation through a bit of a different lens and use a resource management approach that he described earlier. And it identified $237 million worth of avoidable hydrocarbon losses based on a range of products and about 1.3 megatons per year of emission reduction opportunity. And for me, the biggest takeaway from the, this, this, the discussion around this particular case study was the response we got from uh, the operators at various levels within the company. And they, they commented on how policy essentially herded the entire stakeholder community towards implementing an end of pipe solution to this situation. And uh, no consideration was given outside of those, those prescribed policy pathways. And this individual said to us, you know, in essence, that policy is, it, it forced us to see if we could save maybe $20 million uh, in destroying $237 million worth of avoidable hydrocarbon products that we could be uh, recovering and sending into the economy um, and presumably a clean energy economy. So this, this was a stark, um, uh, I guess, a, an opportunity to realize just how much there is need for disruption uh, in our sector as well as other sectors and the disruption needs to take place at the technology as well as at the policy level. And uh, before I close, I'd like to point out one other consideration. Um, these types of case studies, they scale quite well. Dave and I were recently involved in meetings with uh, several assistant deputy ministers across Environment and Climate Change Canada as well as uh, Natural Resources Canada and attending that meeting was the CEO and, and her senior advisor from uh, what they self-describe as is a junior company but very highly regarded in terms of their environmental performance, their social uh, awareness, and their commitment to responsible resource development. And uh, they had identified for us that in 2019, the province of Alberta um, developed a policy opportunity whereby companies could take advantage of credit for early action in regard to the pending regulations within the province of Alberta and across Canada. And uh, the company, as I said, 
very responsible. Uh, they run a really tight ship. And the senior advisor actually told us that he was skeptical that there would be any opportunities found. And he maintained his skepticism and his, I'm almost quoting him here, you know, I remain skeptical throughout the implementation of a technology um, and I didn't truly believe it until they dropped the check on my desk, i.e. the rebates that they got from the government based upon this innovative policy that created opportunities. And so that's why I say if you disrupt policy and technology together, they can identify great opportunities. And this is where I want to segue over to John. John's going to describe an end of pipe technology to you, but it's an end of pipe technology that's being considered after the two and three step process that Dave described earlier. So John is being brought in not to uh, solve a problem in isolation. John is brought, being brought in to the solution space as a contributor to an operational node, a solution into a space that has been optimized for economic outputs, environmental outputs, and social outputs. And then as Dave described earlier, um, in the event that there are some residual products that uh, that can't be economically conserved, then how do we destruct those in such a way that they are uh, minimally uh, invasive to the environment? And with that, I will stop. Thank you, Mike. Terrific. And just uh, by way of introduction for John, John Cassidy is president of Flare Tech Incorporated and has 30 years of experience designing and manufacturing flare systems for this industry. Show you, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can, great. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Unfortunately, what happened, uh, the animation that I was going to show you uh, had a last minute problem with it and we weren't able to correct that. So what I've got here is basically just uh, a picture of the flare system that Dave had sent to us. Uh, as you can see, quite a bit of smoke coming off of it. Uh, the flare tip on this is a uh, fixed slot design. So uh, can't use pressure on lower flow rates to enable it to burn, combust smokelessly. Uh, so you'll see the smoke coming off of there. Um, at high flow rates, this flare would be smokeless, but at low flow rates, it's going to create this, this smoke. Um, there's different technologies that you can do to help mitigate that. Uh, on this particular flare, what we proposed and uh, is going to be implemented was to go with an air assisted tip instead of this type of tip that's on here right now. So in, in order to do that we'll start by removing the existing flare tip, it's flanged, uh, removing the uh, ladders, cages off of there. We also provide a technology that is retractable pilots with pilot monitoring and ignition system that is totally retractable to grade. Uh, the big feature that that gives is it allows an operator to be able to lower the pilot system to ground level while the flare remains in operation. So you don't have to have a plant shut down, which costs people money. Uh, they can bring the pilots down one at a time. There's multiple pilots up there. Um, each one is monitored to ensure that it's always ignited in case you get uh, any flaring event. Um, as we all agree, it's uh, better to avoid the flaring event, uh, conserve the gas if you can, and but there's upsets conditions that always happen. So when you they do happen, uh, you know it's best to have the a flare that's going to do as good a job as it can of making sure it doesn't smoke and reducing emissions as much as possible. So ladders platforms were completely going to be removed off this. We'll uh, then add an, an air duct. This is a 20 inch diameter by 100 foot tall flare. Um, we can't make this, this flare 100% smokeless for the full range with uh, just modification, modifying it. But 
the reduced flow rates, we can make it uh, make it smokeless. So there'll be a 18 inch diameter air duct with a blower that's gonna mount up the side of it. There'll be a new flare tip that mounts at the top of it. Uh, we'll install two retractable pilots with our pilot monitoring and ignition system onto it to make sure that any waste gas that comes out of there is combusted. Um, our pilot systems incorporate a wind shroud into the top of them to make sure that any wind direction cannot affect the, the com ensuring that it lights off the waste gas. Uh, we'll also be putting in a, a variable frequency drive to control the speed of the blower in relation with the waste gas flow uh, to make sure, as you saw on that steam assisted flare where it put out the flame, things like that don't happen. It ramps up as it needs to, to provide the right amount of air to ensure that we are getting a good destruction efficiency through the complete range. Um, that's pretty much all that, uh, that is going to go on with this flare. And I'm sorry we didn't, couldn't have the animation on there, but uh, this is about as good as I could do in, a, in a, what happened there right at the last. <laughs> No problem. That that's a terrific visual for us. Thank you, John. With our remaining time, we're going to spend about 10 minutes fielding any technical questions and then we'll transition to any higher level or policy related questions. And please feel free to enter your questions either in the question box or in the chat. So we'll start with uh, one question going back to why six of the eight sites were identified as financially attractive uh, flaring mitigation opportunities. So I think um, that's a question for Dave. <clears throat> so we looked at what the, the payback period was for each of the opportunities and we benchmarked them against a payback period of four years, which is a typical rule of thumb that a lot of oil and gas companies like to see their projects have at least that level of payback. Uh, if it was a higher risk project, they might expect to see a, a larger payback. These weren't deemed to be high risk opportunities. And in fact, the, um, the payback periods that we were seeing were, except for the two that exceeded the four year benchmark, the rest were much less than than the four-year threshold and in fact the operators um, decided to take action on at least three of those and we believe that at least five of them um, would be reasonably attractive based on normal thinking and, and considerations that an oil company would apply. Um, again these are off-the-shelf technologies that were being considered so there was nothing um, unusual or unique about them that would um, add uncertainty or add concern to the um, the evaluation of these opportunities. And so the answer, the short answer is they were less than four years payback and, and we had a strong positive response from the operators on those. Thank you. And another question, apologies if, if this is something I missed. Did you assess the percentage reduction in terms of flaring achieved by the various cost-effective technologies? And did you look at dollars per ton of pollution reduced? We have the data to be able to um, express the reductions in terms of tons reduced per um, dollar of capital investment but um, we, we didn't actually express it in those terms. But that would be easy to do from the information that's available, uh, both in the presentation I just gave, but um, as well in the reports that are publicly available for those sites. And in terms of the percentage reduction that was achieved, um, in, in all the cases, it was showing that we were getting effectively complete reduction of the um, for elimination of the flaring where it was economic at least to, to do so. Um, recently we have, as part of the ongoing work that we're doing, we've gone back and rerun the results for, um, for one of the sites 
and we've taken a more rigorous approach to how we would size the equipment. And in that analysis, it shows that um, it's not practical to design for the, the peak flaring events, at least at the site we were rerunning. Um, it, it was an optimum value that existed somewhere between the minimum flow that was observed in the peak flow, and that tended to be typically somewhere around the, the average flow rate or slightly above the average flow rate. Uh, so there would be, in the, in the initial years where decline hasn't set in or had as much of an impact, there would be um, some flaring that would take place, and there's a potential for some flaring to take place near the end of the time series. If you get to situations where your turn down on the, the mitigation measure doesn't allow for uh, full capture of the um, is too low to allow capture of the gas and, and mitigation. So you might see flaring at the beginning and at the end of the series, but um, over most of it, you would see no flaring. Thank you for clarifying. We have one more technical question and then we'll we'll talk policy. So this last one is, is there a way to estimate the black carbon reduction when we apply an upgrade of um, a flare? So the answer to that is is yes. Um, we used um, estimation techniques where we estimated what the black carbon emission contribution would be based on the flare gas flow rate and the heating value of that gas stream. So anything that you do to reduce the heating value of that stream will reduce the um, the flow rate in part, but it will also reduce the um, sooting potential of that, that stream. So whatever would be done, our, our analysis considered those impacts and quantified the difference between before and after. Um, but the other option is, of course, to, to actually do physical measurements, which is what we were, um, but we did it on the front end. Um, and with some of the carry-on work that we're doing, there's the likelihood that we will be going back to some of these sites after the technologies have been implemented and um, do a second measurement to quantify what the true uh, reduction is. And and Sarah, if I could add to what Dave just shared, this is Mike here. Um, if the poser of the question uh, goes to the URL uh, link that I provided to Carleton University's uh, Energy and Emissions Research Lab Library of uh, peer-reviewed publications, there's actually a paper there quite close to the top of the list uh, authored by Bradley Conrad and Matthew Johnson, and it describes a case study um, out of Ecuador, and I believe there's some Mexico data in there as well, and in there is the heating value-based emission factor that David used to uh, develop the, the, uh, um, the results for black carbon mitigation uh, on this project. Great. Uh, another, um, Mike, while you're uh, <laughs> on the unmuted, another one for you. Great to see the work the Government of Canada is doing in this space. Which partner countries are you focused on outside of Canada? Thanks for that question. So currently we have active projects in China, in Mexico, and in Colombia as well. We also have uh, a project um, that is administered uh, from Inside Environment and Climate Change Canada that has us engaged with the Pacific Alliance Partnership. And that partnership includes not only Mexico and Colombia, but uh, Peru and Chile and if I am not mistaken, I believe Ecuador is in the process of um, joining the Pacific Alliance. Excellent. Uh, let's see, it looks like, John, I missed one of the technical, one final technical question for you. In that last flare image, the questioner is asking uh, about the blower. Is it provided for smokeless flaring during normal operation or also for emergency operation? Uh, it would be for any any type of flaring that would come up to the flare. 
normal operation if there you know if there was gas uh, normally going up up to the flare then uh, it would probably be a, a lower amount so automatically the the blower would slow down with the variable frequency drive and then at any time that the high flow rates would come it would automatically ramp up to the maximum great i think we covered that question but um if the questioner has any follow-ups just enter them please in the chat and then we'll move on to a policy question who thanks the speakers for addressing the point regarding prescriptive policies any thoughts on how we get around punitive policies already in place that prevent companies from looking into opportunities because it would mean admitting they have the a flaring and emissions problem particularly in developing countries oh that is a wonderful question and it uh, it provides it, it provides years and years of discussion opportunity um, but the, suffice it to say that uh, the, the questioner is obviously identifying something that's real uh, and it's faced all over the world, uh, even though there's reference there to developing countries, uh, we, we face the challenges um, across the spectrum of developed and undeveloped economies. Um, from our experience, uh, we've, I think, resigned ourselves to identifying what are the circles of influence that we actually occupy and differentiate between those and the ones that we currently can't influence. And so um, I'm going to state some assumptions here. My assumption based upon the question is that there may be a, an understanding or a position that um, there's currently no ability to influence government policy, for example, but there's, there's reference made to companies. And in my final slide, you'll notice on top of that slide, I indicated that government and corporate policies uh, sometimes need to be disrupted. So the degree to which we can address policy within our circle of influence and uh, what I would bring forward for consideration is one of Dave's early slides where he undertook an evaluation of the flare fuel gas stream in terms of what is its value as natural gas and we're all aware that uh, you know sometimes we get a heating value premium for natural gas that's quite incremental and then he juxtaposed that with the commodity values uh, if you were to strip out those um, the various saleable species within the uh, within the current stream and very often uh, corporate policy and corporate hurdle rates uh, dictate if and when something is uneconomic to implement as an opportunity um, and it's typical that when we use the the natural gas based approach and develop economics for a project around natural gas even if there is a slight heating value premium there for it that the projects can often fail whereas if we help our uh, policy people within our companies to understand that if we were to take a resource management based approach as opposed to the waste management approach and implicit in that is if we were to deploy some instrumentation that uh that provides us with the type of detail that Dave described, we might be able to unpack currently overlooked opportunities that a company would suddenly implement independent of the policy influences that are challenging it from, from outside. So I, I realize in what I've shared, I haven't necessarily directly answered the question, uh, but it's, it's some thought and then in regard to potentially influencing policy outside our circle of influence I would propose that perhaps partnerships and platforms such as the climate and clean air coalition and others are platforms whereby I think there's a stated intention to disrupt globally jurisdictional policies across environment energy social uh, as well as economic um, that could become a 
strategic opportunity if stakeholders are like-minded and if there's actually a strategic communications intent and objective developed via the platform, be it the CCAC or any of its analogs, that might be a way of penetrating outside of our own circles of influence into those circles that we need to disrupt badly in order for us to achieve uh, some of the outcome objectives that we need to. I'll stop there and I'm wide open to having a clarifying question posed in regard to that because I fully realized that I didn't fully answer it. Thanks for answering, Mike. That's a big, important question. And um, take a look at the chat to see if there are any follow-ups. And the follow-up is, yes, but how can we do this disruptive change? How can we implement that or make it happen? Yeah, no, that's that's a fair question, and I I would, you know, potentially de de defer here to um, Denise to maybe comment after I have. I understand that under the current, call it the rebranding or the reorganization of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition partnership in whole, one of the stated objectives for the partnership going forward is to improve its uh, its reach into partner and non-partner countries, and in particular to develop more targeted, more strategic, perhaps more effective communications strategies to reach into the policy um, elements of the regulatory population within various countries. So, uh, Denise, does that serve as a bit of a primer for you to perhaps add some some observations or some commentary to uh, to that question? Um, actually, I'm I'm unmuting the the person who asked the question. It's um, Helena Molin Valdez, who is the secretariat of the climate and the the head of the secretariat of the CCAC. Helena, did you want to um, to expound on your question? No, no. Maybe first of all, thank you so much. This is can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Because the machine is speaking to me, so I got scared. Anyhow, no, I, I thank you so much uh, for the presentations. At least for me, it was really helpful to see the sequence of and, and the real scope of the work that you have done. It's quite impressive. I feel that we are not using this enough. And uh, sitting in the Secretariat of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, uh, I wonder how do you see potential for how we as a as a global group uh, that in many occasions don't necessarily directly work with the oil and gas sector uh, because uh, we often and mostly work through the environment ministries or the environment platforms how how do you how can we scale this up and make it more visible i mean i i fail to to see the the next real uh, thing that we should be doing because we are working a lot on methane and we are looking at methane studies and we are trying to scale up uh, both regulatory work and supporting the companies uh, in the oil and gas methane partnership but on the flaring side and, and in, in as a complement to what's already out there uh, how do you see us making with small resources that we have a big difference especially i was very intrigued by your discourse around the disruptive integrated policies in both technologies uh, to make this disruption of, of, of practice. I, 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 I'm, we are open to hear your views on this because the, indeed our, our CCAC, the coalition as a whole, is trying to, to, to change gear a little bit to ensure that what we do uh, have the biggest impact. And this is one of the bigger areas, both on black carbon and methane release. So we are very keen on seeing how we can do our part, let's say. I'm genuinely interested well, in hearing your views. Well, thank you for that clarification, Elena, and it's it's really good to hear from you again. Um, I'm going to uh, tag team with Dave Picard here. I'll start, and then hopefully um, I will hand him a torch that's actually lit. Um, so I, I think one of the ways that 
the CCAC or any um, partnership or entity that's seeking to uh, achieve the disruptive outcomes that we've all described and that we've expressed um, liking is uh, to focus perhaps on one of the slides that David presented towards the end of his presentation. And that slide differentiates from left to right um, the approaches that have historically been taken via partnerships such as the CCAC, the Global Methane Initiative, Methane to Markets, the Asia Pacific Partnership. We've been involved in them all from the ground floor uh, quite, quite um, uh, extensively. And I, I think one of the things that I would put forward for consideration is that some of the communications products and some of the approaches that are taken uh, and described in the left-hand column of David's slide uh, identify products that at best they suggest that there are some broad opportunities that um, might be or probably are available within a jurisdiction or within a company but they have to date failed um, quite chronically at creating bankable and actionable uh, opportunities that could be implemented either uh, at the company level or at the jurisdictional level um, and my sense is that one of the changes that could take place going forward and especially in light of helena as you said you know the the challenges to the limited resources that we have is to potentially divert attention away from what david described in the left hand column and that is running out into the global community and undertaking many superficial projects uh, or activities that don't identify projects per se, and perhaps concentrate resources into identifying, as I described in several of my slides, high impact opportunities that uh, have a really disruptive potential. Because um, those high impact opportunities can become case studies from which uh, the whole stakeholder community can learn. And that includes you know, the policy development uh, community within companies as well as countries, as well as the operations or the technical um, side of the, the ecosystem. So that might be a consideration. And Dave, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and, and maybe get you to add some thoughts and some observations. Um, the, the thoughts or observations that I would add are that what has historically happened is we've been engaging primarily with the environmental groups and, and that is important because they're the ones that typically would report out what the reduction potentials are and if there's reductions achieved what those reductions are uh, but they're not the ones that would actually take ownership of an implementation project it's the operations and engineering groups that will undertake that work and they're the ones that ultimately have to be convinced and initially going in a lot of those groups tend to have this reluctance to engage and the reluctance i think is based on the history of people coming in and, and identifying something as being a meaningful opportunity without considering all the site specific constraints and and that puts them in a, an unfavorable light in front of senior management saying that why aren't you addressing this this opportunity it's so wonderful um, but if you can go in and, and provide the level of rigor and engage with those people at a level that um, gives them the opportunity to voice their concerns and, and have their uh, their priorities addressed then it's been much more productive and, and so we've gone from people considering what we're doing is identifying problems to a point where these same groups are now looking at us as being a way of <coughs> providing opportunities and, and actually implementing things that will help make them look better in senior management. And I, I guess the other piece that has come out of the work we've been doing is if you try to enter at the mid management level and interact with organizers or the stakeholders within a company, um, it, it sometimes is, is helpful, but it, it often 
tends to fail. The, the, the best success we've had is where you come in with a top-down approach, where you've got senior executives within the company saying, that, yes, this is important. Yes, we need this to happen. Yes, you can commit time and support to these activities, and we endorse what you're doing, and you're not going to be penalized. This is not a, a witch hunt. This is an opportunity to identify things that we can do to improve our performance and our profitability. And, and if you take it from that perspective, it, it seems to change things dramatically. Well, this has been an excellent 90 minutes and I wanna thank all of the informed speakers and um, oh, apologies for the background noise. As we close, clearly we heard that there's a real need to address these emissions and we heard about the importance of raising awareness with companies and governments around these win-win solutions. So I want to thank everyone for their time. And if you have any additional questions, uh, please send those in via the CCAC Secretariat and we'll work to get them answered for you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice day, evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you Bye. all. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.